Um, let's uh, start hearing from these folks because they we can't keep them here absolutely all night, and then we'll maybe hear a little bit from you afterwards. Uh, so, Andy, do you want to tell us about these fine folks? Why, do I, why did I, you know, decide? Why did I talk to you about who these people are and why they should be talking to us? I have been us? dying to introduce <laughs> Kent and Amy together. So, Kent has been at SPS for about two years now. So is Amy. Kent was a llama farmer before he got to SPS. Uh, just a really friendly face. So, we want to show you this one. Uh, so Kent and Amy are uh, VPs, part of the uh, leadership team here in technology at SPS. Amy oversees the technology operations team, and Kent is a VP of product development. And so obviously very close to a lot of the strategic decisions that get made. And uh, I think one of the things that I value a lot about being an SPS over the course of the time that I have is just that we've been really good about making decisions that allow us to do things well. So uh, I think that this is a great panel to, to get things started tonight, to just talk a little bit about um, how they viewed um, AWS as technology and what that's going to allow us to do in the future and why it was a good direction to go. And uh, if you are in a situation where you need to be able to articulate some of that back to your business or think about how that applies to your business, I think this is going to be really useful. So it's a great way to kick things off. Thanks for, thanks for staying late. Yeah. They're usually here this late anyway. So. <laughs> that's very nice. Thank you. Thanks, I left. I left what you the, what you farmed. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, they grow things. So. Yeah. Yeah, plants generally die. Thank you. All right. So Kent and Amy, you can come on up. Thank you so much for both being here. I think this is really exciting because I've you know been using AWS for some time and possibly under the leadership of some of, spoiler alert, the same people and or persons who may have made the decisions here. And I know that uh, Jamie couldn't be here with us today because of business travel, but can you talk a little bit about what led SPS to AWS and when these decisions were made and why? Sure, sure, I can start. Um, actually, uh, when I was first talking to Jamie about coming to SPS, we were talking about uh, the fact that at some point we wanted to have global data center presence potentially. Um, we weren't able to maybe move at the speed we needed to today. Uh, and the current data center that we have in St. Paul wasn't meeting some of our needs. Uh, and so we're talking about, well, do we move to another data center? Do we build out worldwide? Uh, Jamie clearly had done a fair amount with uh, AWS in the past. Uh, and so pretty quickly came to the understanding, you know, we should just do AWS because there's just the whole, I mean, it's nothing that none of you know about. The agility, the, the speed for our, our development and operations team, and operations really, in, in some sense, being able to pick up the pace of delivery for the business. Yeah, I, I guess I'd also add to that, and uh, uh, by the way, Amy and I literally started on the same day. Yeah. Um, oh. So we go back to the exact same history, I think. Oh, and that and was, before so, we go too far with that, since we mentioned Jamie, who's a person who's not here, who a bunch of people don't know, maybe yeah. you should also mention who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah great yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Jamie Finkelstead is the CTO for SPS Commerce. Amy and I uh, both report and did him. He started. I believe just a couple months before we did, like August of 2013, mm -hmm. we were on board in December of 2013. But at that time, there was, there really weren't, there really was not a mature cloud environment to be in. Um, AWS at that point had such a head start on everyone else that it was a relatively simple decision to be made. And of course, his background and my background and Amy's background in cloud environments prior to that just seemed to make sense. Right. And, and I had had experience of building data centers worldwide and understood the costs that go with just having a presence in a location and the build out of the, to put a single rack in a data center uh, somewhere in the APAC region is a lot of money versus just moving really quickly and putting some, some easy two instances out there. Right. And in the, at that point, you started thinking about like, do we need half of a gig? Like, yeah, yeah. just trying to make calculations, yeah. it's yeah. really hard to make yeah. a leasing decision ahead of time when yeah. you're trying to move right. quickly. I right. will openly cry if I have that conversation again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when you're making these decisions, since you do both have a background in, um, you know, actual facts, physical data centers, uh, what about hybrid cloud? Like, talk to us a little bit about what, where does it make sense to actually have any kind of data center stuff when you're also having AWS? Do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah, I guess I. Um, I'm going to so, ask a tough question. Sorry. No, no. no um, 
that's that's fine. That's a really good question. Uh, prior to SBS, I was a CTO at Bloom Health. Bloom Health, Bloom Health was a private exchange to find contribution. Very, very, very HIPAA compliant thing. Um, that industry, I would say, while I think it aligns well to the cloud, regulations really made that difficult. And I think those regulations were around, around HIPAA and around perception of what the cloud was, and that was a tough sell. It's not clear, I still think, business-wise and technology-wise, it's the right decision. It's just a little bit harder to sell in that industry. Yeah, we, we actually had a talk last year at DevOps Days Minneapolis from Colleen Vila, who was a oh, cloud administrator awesome. there. Yeah, she's and awesome. She, yeah, she was talking about the role your own versus SaaS, yep. you know, versus like buy, build, what are you actually going to do? And she talked about the regulatory environment, which, I mean, even in retail, I, I suppose the uh, dreaded letters PCI come yeah. into play. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and hybrid data center is definitely, I mean, we are doing hybrid data center right now. So we have applications that run in both our co-location in St. Paul and in AWS. Uh, and we actually have app servers in both and run active-active for app and web tier across that hybrid data center. There's definitely challenges that come along with that. Um, but I, I would expect at some point long term we have some kind of hybrid data center uh, for, for quite a while, especially when we think about some of our more legacy applications that may not you know, fit into AWS really well. And that kind of makes me wonder, like, do you end up needing to go with something like Direct Connect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. so I, there was a really funny um, picture that was making rounds on the internet a while ago that was like, rename all the AWS services to what they actually are, and I think Direct Connect, which is like a lease line between your data center and an AWS region, I think they renamed that to like give AWS all your money or something. So, all right, so can you give us an idea, and of course, you know, for competitive reasons, I know you're not gonna go into great detail, but can you give us an idea of the size, scope, scale, something about your footprint in AWS that gives us an idea as to whether or not this is just some devs spinning up some instances oh, from time no. to time, or what's your, what's your usage footprint look like? Yeah, in so terms of services, in terms of scale, whatever. Quite large in comparison to our overall footprint. Um, and as we go through the, the rest of the year, it will only increase. We have a lot of production that is uh, in AWS. Um, in fact, a lot that is being built directly for AWS. Um, so I think in terms of hundreds of uh, instances and, and not dozens, uh, spanning across uh, different environments. Uh, I, I think our mandate is, I think where we've been true to this, that all net new is being built in AWS, and we're moving into more microservices, distributed stuff, and as we cleave that off, that's actually moving in AWS as well. Now, what about the uh, the notion of multi-cloud or lock-in? Like, what is, what is your take on that? Because, of course, that's one of the things that people bring up. It's a great question. Um, Many of our applications um, are built with some of the services in AWS, which gives us, again, that agility that we were talking about, the speed of delivery for our development teams to be, to be using them. In fact, you'll hear about some of them a little bit later on after Kent and I are done giving this spiel. You'll get to see some of the cool tech that we're doing um, using the services. And, and that, of course, you're not going to move that. Uh, but we definitely do talk to other call providers and look at long term where should we be as a business uh, and are keeping that in mind. Yeah. I, I also believe that if you kind of are not going all in into it, you're not really realizing the value of it. Um, and you know, if, if cloud portability for whatever reason is, is something that you need to achieve, um, I think that, that that's great, but I think you might not be realizing the benefit of it. I will say too that I think some of these other cloud providers, especially Google, is starting to get a lot into that analytics world that frankly I don't see AWS doing to that extent. So there's a nice division of, of concerns there. Yeah, and just to add on to that, cloud portability was not something that was a mandate as we started this. It was Correct. really how fast can we deliver for the business because we had a backlog that wasn't being met, uh, and we are you know, revamping so many applications, we have to make the way as fast as possible for our development teams. And Kent mentioned microservices, and that's a really good thing to think about too, is this is not an all or nothing sort of decision. As Amy is alluding to, there might be some applications that it makes sense to have hybrid, there might be some applications it makes sense to keep on-prem, or prem is in St. Paul somewhere. Um, <laughs> 
And there's, there's applications um, from what you're describing that it makes sense to use the higher level AWS services. And then that also means there's other applications that you don't. And maybe those ones you can look at um, portability options for because uh, you know, your, say, failover to another cloud provider is more important than being able to use a specific high-level AWS service for that microservice. Absolutely. Like when you're, when you're decoupling your, uh, you know, down to the needs of the business, like you, can, you have that kind of flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah, and we definitely look at it on a product-by-product basis. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're, I don't want to keep you too long since I know that I, I think at that VP level, they expect you to start answering email at like 6.30 in the morning, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the... Earlier today. <laughs> so, um, so I don't want to keep you too long, so I guess I'll just, you know, as kind of a parting thought, so, um, you know, first Kent and then Amy, uh, what is the thing you're the most interested in or excited about in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months of what you think you're going to be able to do with AWS? Uh, <clears throat> serverless architectures. Yeah. I think that, I think Paul the is going to be talking to that Bryce a little bit, well. and Bryce, oh, sorry, uh, Bryce as well. I think that is just, there's just something about that that just screams interesting. Um, there's clear use cases for that, but to the breadth at which that can be applied, especially as AWS high-level services evolve, is gonna be incredibly interesting. Yeah, yeah definitely, that's a definitely interesting place to be, though. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish they would have picked a different name for it, though, because like, I hear serverless, and I'm like, oh, there's a no. server, you just don't have to manage it. Like, <laughs> it's kind of like the cloud. It's, it's just someone else's computer. Like, sure. In a data center, you don't have to run. It's not magic. Sure. But, so, uh, yeah, the, the word serverless kind Maybe of makes me go, Maybe we can pass that what? feedback to the AWS. Yeah, <laughs> AWS, that word, it's not just them, though. Like, it's an industry trend word right now, it's kind of silly. But, um, but yeah, the Lambda stuff, very exciting. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, all right. What well, you, you took the fun me? one because that's, that's absolutely a lot what we're talking about. You're allowed to be excited about that too, but what else but, have you um, I'd say certainly containers are a big thing for us as a company, uh, and how do we quickly deploy uh, with containers? But um, you know, I'm a database person at heart. I love I love the what's going on with Aurora, and we're moving things into Aurora, which is cool, uh, and Redshift as well. So. And I think that's a great place to leave it because guess what? Like everyone gets excited about stateless. But state is where your customers and money are, so it actually matters. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken and Amy. You're welcome. Thank you. Give Amy Thank and you. Ken a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I don't even have the schedule in front of me. I just have this countdown timer, which well, means. Uh, Mr. Clayton. Is up there. So, Mr. Clayton is next. Uh, and and, and to <laughs> be, let's let's be really let's fair. At, what's that? Yes. First. Simple workflow. Uh, so, just the one thing I would want to stress here is that um, I definitely I, I don't feel like I pulled teeth, but I definitely did get uh, did get some folks to come talk to us who I maybe don't always. Um, Convince as easily, so I don't know if I just have uh, so promised good beer or something like that. But uh, I, I think since you're their what their boss or their boss's boss, I think this is what they call voluntold. Yeah. You were yes. voluntold. You were Every voluntold. SPS employee talking today, I'm their boss's boss, <laughs> <laughs> including Kent and Amy. They just don't know that. <laughs> All right, so uh, in, uh, just uh, inter introduce Andy really quick. So Andy's been working on. Um, uh, Andy Edney, are you talking to? Fun. Oh, Andy Edney, we have a second mic here, Nate. I didn't know that. This is fun. Maybe have, you're on this topic too. Fantastic. We'll All right. Like so uh, they've been working on a project internally at SPS. We have some really interesting um, orchestration uh, technology problems to solve because of the way that our system processes supply chain data and has to uh, essentially kind of map out where that traffic's going, what it needs to be mapped into, who it's going to, all of those types of things. So. Um, we really, we really had an interesting orchestration problem since 2002, uh, and haven't. I think we've we've had some good solutions for it, but um, some of the stuff that we've been seeing and using support workflow for it has been really awesome. So I'm really glad that these folks uh, were open and willing to come up here and uh, share their stuff with us. And I'm going to stall now until we get through some of the technical difficulties. Oh, and oh, it was so close. Oh, actually, did I turn the mic off again? Actually, since we're experiencing the sort of technical stuff that leads me to want to ask her, if you can start to maybe come up and fix that. Uh, AWS person who raised your hand earlier, would you like to make yourself known to us again? 
Would you would you like to come up and say hi? There's two of you. Would, would you mind coming up and saying hi for a moment? Come on. <laughs> Don't be shy. They are not going to make any presentations. Um, but we have SPS people only making presentations tonight. But since we happen to have some people who actually work for AWS here, you know, bug requests, bug reports, feature requests, jumping them. Um, I'm just going to give them the mic and let them introduce themselves. And that way you get a chance to put a name to a face or whatever. Hi, my name's Charlie. And uh, relatively new to AWS, I've been about five months. We're building out the team locally. Uh, there's probably about uh, 12 or 15 of us now locally here in the Minneapolis market. Uh, I'm focused primarily on enterprise customers, those customers that are 2 billion to 25 billion um, in the five state area. Um, and I have a number of peers uh, who focus on uh, customers that I don't have access, I don't have time to get to. Hey, I'm Michael Borger, uh, uh, Senior Cloud Architect with Professional Services. I have been with AWS for seven months, which actually puts me in one of the most senior people on mm -hmm. my team in the last year. Uh, and it, again, focusing on cloud journey and cloud transformation for most large enterprises, but I'd also be happy to hear about your enterprise. Mm -hmm. Good. Great, thank you. Okay, awesome. So after the presentations conclude about, you know, eight-ish, then we're going to um, just be mingling, socializing, drinking more beer, eating more tacos, and uh, yeah, we we'll talk to these folks some more. Thank you so much for coming by. All right, Andy, Nate, take it away. Awesome, so yeah, hey, I'm Andy, this is Nate, and we're on the co conference engine team, specifically Nate's on workflow, do whatever. Um, and we handle kind of the core business of SPS. And before we get into like, you know, what about SWF, I was told I should call this WTF SWF. So before we get into that, um, what does SPS do in case you don't know? So SPS, one of the core things we do is connect a network of retailers and vendors globally um, in the tens of thousands. And so a big part of that is getting documents from one to another, which sounds deceptively easy. Um, so say you go to Target and buy a tennis ball. Target has to get that from somewhere, swallowing whoever. And to do that, there's various documents they exchange, and it turns out that both sides might not communicate you know, they might have different APIs for how they get it. They might still be using something like FTP or some uh, language made back when you know every byte mattered. Uh, and so connecting all those together. And so the workflow, the main thing we do is kind of stitch the various things that need to happen. You know, uh, transforms we apply. You know, to change things from one format to another. Maybe it's you know comma separated into something else. We might route it to our analytics platforms. We might. Um, add additional transforms, anything else we need to do. And so to kind of give you an idea of how we got where we are, um, the thing that solved this before was Oracle people. And our implementation had gotten about nine years old by, I think, right around this point. Um, it served us pretty well. You know, it was performant. It, um, it kind of gave good visibility. It had some downsides, though. So I assume I can show these. If not, Someone from SPS, wave your hands really quickly to take a nap. <laughs> so, you know, it has a nice web dashboard. That's great. Um, you can see stuff that's running. Uh, the load that we have on it now means that it takes usually a long time to load, at least when we were using it primarily, minutes. It can show you, you know, the history of a specific workflow. That's good. You can see uh, it did some lookups and whatnot. You can even look at specifics, you know, what did some service return? And that helps, you know, if you had some issue in production, you can't replicate, that's very helpful. Um, you can view that history as XML, and it's maybe useful, kind of. Um, you know, it's something. And you can design it the same way, because, you know, if you want to write XML as code, then you're free to do so, which worked, but it's not the best. Um, and we started hitting issues recently as, you know, Maple's a very kind of traditional data center product. It looks, you know, a lot like this, I think. You know, you can make clusters of it, you can manage them yourself, and that's great, but if you want to scale up, you know, you gotta manage this whole cluster of computers that have, you know, this one shared database for state, that have um, you know, you have to deploy each process to that cluster. You know, it's it's a lot to manage, especially if you need to suddenly handle a big influx of load from a customer. So that's when we started looking at SWF. Um, a lot of the benefits it brought us, um, similar to here, you can see you know, the history of execution. You can actually 
replay executions. So if you want to retry something in a development environment that failed production, but actually you know try to debug it, set breakpoints, something like that, you can do it. Um, and you know, one key thing for us is that you know we talked about vendor lock-in. True, you know, SWF is definitely an AWS service. You know, you, if you want to run it somewhere else, you're going to write your own implementation of it, or you're going to connect back to AWS's version. But unlike people where you know you're writing into their kind of semi-proprietary XML, you're deploying to their server. You write all your own activities in theory in whatever language you want, and they can run wherever as long as they connect out to the SWS service. They just pull for work and do it. Um, so even though you know it's using the SWF API, all kind of the logic around it is in language we write with testing that we can control. You know, it's not something that we have to then try to figure out how to replicate and rewrite if we want to move somewhere else. We would just kind of plug it into a new backend. Um, you know, Lambda was mentioned, it integrates with that. So it can give you an option to kind of like stitch Lambda together if you want a way to kind of orchestrate and track it and see the inputs and outputs that way um, in a whole kind of flow. Uh, I'm not forgetting. And like people said, though, it's not magic. You know, I think it's key to really understand what it does if you want to use it. And specifically, you know, talk to AWS, get to learn about the roadmap, all that. Um, so I don't want to go too much into depth at SWF. Like you can look at the examples, and whatnot. But I think we want to focus maybe on, you know, the gotchas that we found and some of the things we found that were key to monitor and to use it well. Because I think those can kind of apply to any workflow solution. Um, yes. So to show a little bit of that, it's going to show up, and he's going to show some of the kind of the metrics we've made, some of the dashboards we've built, and kind of we'll talk about a little bit of the challenges that we got as we, we went to shift, you know, kind of this huge network over onto SWF from people. Okay, hopefully these technical difficulties will be very short. Okay, so um, I'll start by showing a little bit of what Andrew was talking about. Uh, we actually have a bunch of work going through a demo system of ours at the moment. So you can see me refreshing, we're just clicking through a bunch of workflows. Um, just to give you an idea of our history, so I'll just pick up one particular execution. Uh, SWF is divided up into activities. So your activities are your various steps along the workflow. They're the actual units of work. Um, as Andy mentioned, they pull essentially an internal queue list of work to do, so they just keep processing work as fast as you can go. So scaling-wise, if you're doing a lot of a particular type of work, you add more instances to that activity list, and you've got more workers in your swarm doing the work. So the way that SWF works, it kind of SWF works, it breaks down into, you know, you kick off a workflow, you have a decider that kind of makes decisions and can call up to activities, and then either call to multiple of them in parallel, get the results back, wait for maybe a group of them to complete. Um, and so when we talk about kind of, you know, state is where the info is, I'd say SWF maintains kind of your decision state, and then your activities are able to provide maybe other state outside of there. So you might have an activity that hits a database, you could have an activity that's actually manually completed. So you know, if you're making one that involves fulfilling something, someone maybe actually has to click here and enter some, you know, enter some info that they reached out in the warehouse. So here, here we have uh, apparently Battlebroken. Er, uh, <laughs> Firefox does a little better job. Uh, so these are the list of the various activities that have been called along the workflow. And if, uh, aside from giving you an overall list of what they've gone through, uh, you can click through to any given activity and screen got crunched. Um, you can see exactly what was sent into that activity and then the outputs of that activity, if there were any errors or solutions as well. 
Uh, what Andy was uh, just mentioning as far as manual workflows, we actually, one of, one of the biggest things with dealing with a asynchronous workflow is dealing with your errors. How do you properly handle them so a user can process them? Are they transient errors that can be fixed and resolved, or are they permanent errors that are going to kill the workflow? And we've, we ended up going with a model for transient errors. Say a, say a database goes down. You don't want to have all of your workflows fail and have customers have to resubmit data. So these will go into what is a resumable workflow in SWF. We can go through, stand the database back up again, and make sure the systems are happy, and then go through and resume those workflows. They'll kick off right where they left off with no, no hiccup, just like they never stopped and continue to process the workflow. So the customers are unaffected, there might be a little delay depending on how long it takes to fix the system issue, but otherwise the workflow proceeds normally. Um, these uh, activities are all coordinated with events, and the back end of the workflow, you, so for any given activity, there's actually a list of events that are called. You, so you schedule an event, it starts, and then it completes. This is one of uh, what I'm going to get into with the limitation, or some of how, one of the things you have to work through when you're doing SWF. There are a certain number of throttles and limits that are in the system that um, AWS is very friendly about increasing a lot of them, the ones that they can, um, but initially you start out fairly constricted, and so uh, getting to know what you're going to bump up against, seeing the throttling errors, knowing what to ask for is very important. The events fits into a category of a limit that they will, they do not or cannot increase typically, um, although they're making some changes around that. Uh, where if you have a rather long run workflow, let's say you have a thousand different things you want to do along the step, each one of those is going to take three of these events to call, plus whatever overhead is in your workflow otherwise. At some point, there's a 25,000 limit. So we have, we have a system at, uh, mentioned our primary workflow, some of the documents we receive from a customer actually split into a bunch of pieces before they end up at many, many, many other customers or just different, say if um, Walmart wants to send something to every single one of their stores, it's going to split into those thousands of pieces. Well, each of those splits takes a certain number of events and then every time we, every, everything we did after that took a certain number of events and we were hitting this event limit relatively quick. Um, our, our solution was to actually split our workflow around those splits so that we uh, essentially have a two-step workflow for all of our process. We start with the initial documents coming in, we do any of, figure out any of that splitting that needs to occur, and then we start off a completely new set of workflows to handle the outbound. So we end up getting a clearer picture of the true document outflow versus inflow, as well as uh, basically eliminating any problems we're having with these event limits. So the, let me go back to our dashboard. So the, uh, right now there's a variety of state. Right now we're processing fairly successfully. Uh, we do have a, a certain number of failed workflows that have come through here. I can give you an example. So we have something called the Error Hospital, which is basically where we, it's a, it's a database and a visual engine for storing our errors, and we are able to, you can see what we're submitting up, so any of these errors can be processed. Uh, I don't have what I was looking for here, sorry. So, um, uh, along with that Error Hospital, the, the resumable tickets have a task token that presented, and that can actually be resumed not just through our software, but through any client. It's a submission that goes into SWF and allows it to resume. So, we I've been doing a lot of work with getting us up to speed. That we, in order to process our full production workflow, uh, particularly during Cyber Week, we need to do something like 150,000 to 200,000 operations an hour. And given each one of our workflows takes anywhere from well, the the quick ones are eight to 20 seconds. Some of the longer ones can be in the minutes or hours, so getting a process that runs that long to do 200,000 an hour, you need a lot of parallelism. And so, uh, the wonderful feature of the cloud, that's what we get. But there are still limitations. So, um, you'll, AWS makes a big point of the fact that you can have a million concurrent workflows or more, but you have to keep in mind that you have resources that aren't necessarily scaling to the same scope as that, such as, say, your database. So if you 
uh, Oracle caps off at a wonderful 10,000 connections. If you have 20,000 clients, they're not all going to be able to connect. So you're, uh, the, at some point, you need to limit yourself along with your limitations. Otherwise, you'll end up choking on various data points. So example, the two, two biggest features, let me see if I've got a little more data here. So the two biggest metrics that are the most important in SWF, your schedule to start time is any one of these jobs that's going to an activity worker. You queue, when it goes up to the queue, the schedule to start is we dropped it in the queue, it has an activity work, an available activity worker picked it up to do the work. If you're seeing lag in this time, that typically means you don't have enough workers to do the work. And so we're able to, we're able to see that scaling. So this graph in the left over here, display. Um, these lines are our individual activity workers and you can see right now this one's taking a half a second to pick up and that's a, actually a little bit slow for most of ours. We're, they tend to be in the sub 100, sub 200 milliseconds when things are performing well. Um, uh, these, these graphs can be a little funny to read. I actually have multiple data, data points on them so the scale on the left I have for our workflows and the scale on the right is for our activity workers, so depending on the line you're looking at, it actually has a different scale. Uh, tend to have different operational. And the, the connected code to that, this graph down below, is start to close. So this is once the activity worker has actually picked up the work, how long did it take to actually do the job? So if you have issues, say this is a, uh, one of our transformation engines is taking particularly long, or it's a database call that's taking too long to return, you can see here more of your more of your stats as far as how well your actual services are performing, and see if you need to do some improvement there to get them to move faster. Uh, this includes decision tasks. So the the decider is your chore the choreographer of your workflow. Um, everything goes to and fro the decider. So every, between every activity call, the the decider is what's deciding how your workflow progresses. But that means your workflow is being hit every in between every run. So they. Uh, it's important to have your code as trim as possible within these workers so that the, the real meat of the job, the transforms, the whatever your business processes are the ones that are chewing up the time, not the choreography in the middle. And so we can see our, uh, scroll down a little bit more. So this is the line for, uh, right now it's taking about a, a second for my decider to do its work, which is particularly slow actually. So got some work to do. Um, we also have a number of other maps. This is just a CloudWatch dashboard, so any of the metrics from your EC2 instances from any of your Amazon services can be displayed through here. And we're looking at things like the CPU activity on our various deciders to see how well the, how they're being driven. And this is actually selected via auto-scaling group, so you don't have to manually add your 10, 100, 1,000, million, however many EC2 instances to these. You can have a single auto scaling group and it'll reflect the overall CPU activity, as well as we're looking at network to see if that's choking our instances. Um, also looking at, and then these are our queues. So our system is entirely fed through inbound and outbound queues. So we're able to best monitor our workflow by looking how, how tasks are pulled on or off of these queues. So right now this is the 85,000, sorry, the 85,000 jobs I'm currently processing through with our system. And we get to watch as they cruise along and manager tweaks along the way. Uh, so a, a lot of, um, uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on, I mentioned the throttles. So when, it, when you get an AWS throttle, it's, it's fairly expensive. That the, the code essentially does a bit of a sleep routine wait, waiting to try again in a certain amount of time. So you hit a fair bit of cost when you hit one of their throttles. We've implemented our own throttles that are, are scaled to accommodate the kind of workflow that we want to see. And we adjust those along with AWS so that we would rather hit one of our throttles before we hit one of their throttles because it is way less, way less expensive. So we've implemented a lot of these features. The, um, when I look at my dashboard, notice this active executions number is floating right around 350. 
I am arbitrarily capping that at 350 parallel executions because I know that the number of workers who stood up or the database parallelism we have, et cetera, that, has, that can handle about that simultaneous workflow. So we are, we are arbitrarily capping ourselves at that parallelism to see the throughput that we want. If you let that go out of control, then all of your individual services start falling over as their, res their dependent resources get over overtaxed. So it's good to keep those in mind and uh, adjust them accordingly. So that is yeah. most of what I have. And a big part of that is, you know, kind of we mentioned, you know, are you in hybrid cloud or full cloud? A lot of our back end is still, you know, something we're still migrating to AWS. So, you know, if you know that everything's backed by, say, S3 and DynamoDB, maybe you're fine, you can let it rip. Whereas if, you know, you have one RDS instance backing it, that you're still kind of working on getting to a more scalable spot, you got to manage it better. Um, like, some big lessons learned for us, I think, you know, a lot of these are all just kind of the same. It's not magic, you know, you need to know some info about the architecture and all that because, um, you know, there's certain things it does well. So for example, like it has the architectural limit for the decisions and the workflow, do how it works. The decider actually pulls that list down. So if it got too long, we go too slow, or anything in AWS, right? You know, you're gonna pay for workflow, so it's probably not, you know, the fraction of a penny, but it's probably not great for clickstream data. Um, let's see. You know, there's things around versioning and managing the, the workflows if you have long running. You know, they designed it that your workflow could live for a year. Well, you better not change the workflow from under to break it in a certain way because it expects um, your workflow to kind of continue to be there and you're running that yourself. Um, yeah, the, the deciders and the activity workers are version locked, so uh, based on a shared common library. So there, when the workflow calls out for our data store activity version 1.7.11, if we've deprecated that and we've stood up a dot 12, that activity is going to sit there, pull, it's going to sit in the queue and never get pulled off, et cetera. So you need to manage blue green import uh, deployments are very important so that you can drain your older workflow tasks before you start up your new ones, uh, being able to coordinate between the two. We've, we've also implemented some infrastructure to be able to dynamically turn on and off the, our workflow starters so that we can, uh, can explicitly control what's being started and stopped, allow for better queue draining, et cetera. Yeah, so just to close, I guess I'd say, you know, given all the caveats, you know, the big part we see is it shows you kind of all this work in workflow linked together. So you have a whole bunch of services that are being hit and you can actually see input and output to all of them. Um, so if you have any specific questions, we can answer now or maybe after. Um, we can take a, a few questions here. We got a couple other speakers to get to, so we'll maybe cut the questions short, but any specific ones up? Uh, uh, what do you guys use for uh, it would be it would be better if the mic went to the questioner because that way we can make sure that the questions also make it to the video. This is being uh, yes. videotaped. We'll be on the internet. I was just curious, what you guys use for infrastructure as code to manage the AWS environment, or are you clicking through to create your dev and product environment? So, so yeah, we the same. Yeah, so we use uh, CF Engine. Or CF Engine. Sorry, I was talking about CF Engine earlier. CloudFormation, similar, uh, and Puppet. So a lot of ours are still running in EC2. Like I said, though, it has Lambda integration, so that's also an option, and then you don't have to you know, manage it quite as much. In fact, Paul will later a cool way to manage Lambda. Yeah, we have a we have a future roadmap for our product. Um, we were only able to recently use Lambda because of our VPC. The VPC support was only recently added. So now that we can use Lambda for activity workers, a lot of the ones that fit within the Lambda construct, the limited amount of time, limited amount of memory, we're planning on moving our activity workers into that realm to get rid of a lot of EC2 instances. But you can definitely run it anywhere. You know, you could run it in your data center and connect out with live options. Uh, hi, I'm Dan. Um, Dan. Can you do anything, uh, maybe you mentioned this, can you do anything asynchronous akin to promises where where one task asks another, hey, what are you, you going to do this? And it says, yeah, I'll get back to you. Uh, that is the entirety of how this works. So anytime you call, anytime you call an activity, uh, whether you want it to be synchronous or not, it's coming back in a promise. And I can tell you, promise hell is fun. Um, <laughs> when you're, uh, particularly once you start getting collections, lists of promises within a promise within a list within a promise within lists of promises and promises, and sorting those all down, and making sure they stay promises and don't end up being orphan child as well. Uh, it's something you get better at the more you work with it, but 
uh, everything within here works that way. And then within the workers themselves, the uh, flow framework has the asynchronous tab. So even if you're not calling out to an activity worker, you can have the same blocking and the same asynchronous calls within your methods. Yeah, so it, it's worth maybe calling out, like the SWF API is very simple. Um, where it's kind of like your decider can kick off a whole bunch of activities, and as soon as something's changed, it'll re-execute your decider to you know decide what to do with that fact. Um, on the other side, they have a lot of kind of frameworks built up um, to help you write deciders that you know stitch that together using promises. Um, I know like Netflix wrote one in Groovy that I think kind of hides some of that a little bit, but it's still under the covers. All right, I think we've got to call it here. Nick and Andy, that was amazing. A very informative. Can we give it up for Nick and Andy? Yeah. I wrote it right on Twitter. I might have to go delete that tweet. All right, thanks, guys. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be here, I suppose, to maybe answer some questions afterwards as well. Yeah, let's handle all these two breaks. Uh, All right, and next up, so now that you've gotten thinking about SWF and thinking about what you might want to integrate with that, um, next up we're going to hear from Bryce, and we're going to hear about Lambda. So we're going to, as you probably saw in the program for the meetup, we're going to hear about Lambda for, for ops um, first, and then Paul is going to give us a little bit of uh, the Lambda dev magic. So, ooh. That's exciting. So I do, I do want to uh, do a, a quick br a brief intro for um, Bryce here. So I may have coerced Bryce into this one, so be kind to him. Um, I'm really excited about what happened here. So uh, as much as I like to lie about everybody at SPS reporting to me, um, they don't all, they don't all, just most. Um, <laughs> but, but Bryce is on my team, and one of the things that I've been really excited about here is that um, between Bryce and Jeremy, uh, who's also here uh, on our group, we, we really focus a lot on monitoring and what we're doing with monitoring patterns and how we make those easy because we have a lot of change and a lot of new services and a lot of things coming into the system. And uh, just kind of general thought one day, we said, hey, you know what, we could just use these events to trigger actions that can help us be more organized to monitor things. And it, it really impressed me how quickly we were able to go from nothing to something relatively serviceable, obviously not a final version, but relatively serviceable in a very short amount of time in a way that was automating operational tasks. So this isn't something where we're building a microservice or we're building some services that are providing some other uh, greater product or service. This is just us in operation saying, gosh, I would love to be able to just do this whenever this thing happens. Like how many people in ops here have that problem every day? Whenever this thing happens, I need to do this other thing all the time. Um, this just seems like an awesome win, uh, and I thought it was really unique that we started looking at it from an ops perspective. So again, I coerced Bryce, be, be nice, um, but we are on along, so it's all right if you talk fast. All right, good, because it's pretty short, and you stole pretty much the whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Bryce Thompson, I'm an Associate Reliability Engineer here at uh, SPS. Um, with that project, I kind of just wanted to highlight some of the, the big takeaways that I've had and that we've had, uh, and then just some of the um, experience we've had along the way that I can help uh, pass along, maybe. Um, so I guess the first question uh, that Andy kind of touched on here was, uh, why even use Lambda? Uh, the biggest takeaway that I was thinking here is just that it's event-based, so that as soon as you have something that needs attention, Land is able to react to that. And you're not waiting around for cron jobs or anything like that. Uh, and you just have the immediate results. Uh, secondly, that there's no servers, serverless. So there's no extra on top of what you're already managing, um, extra servers to manage in that way. Uh, also, I think Lambda is, is definitely a good step into AWS and actually wasn't all that difficult to start with and to get started with. Some of those uh, examples uh, allow you to get pretty far pretty quickly. And I think I had something working within a week or two, if I'm say around there. I think we had the first result in three days. Three days. <laughs> <laughs> And then my other big takeaway is 
as you're starting to do these things to expect iteration on whatever you're automating. Yeah, you're not gonna get it right the first time, maybe not even the second time. Uh, what we were working on, this was kind of the general uh, plan we would have. New stacks that are deployed, hosts in those stacks would trigger a Lambda function. The Lambda function would register those hosts with uh, our monitoring software, Logic Monitor. Uh, turns out we weren't so lucky and that it wasn't quite that easy. And even if it were that easy, another part of that is that Lambda function was actually starting to get like three, 400 lines of code. And the, uh, I think one of the, the nice things about Lambda is to just have quick things that run so you're not running for like, I don't know, I think the execution is up to like 20 seconds at some points. <coughs> Oh, and then just setting yourself up uh, for that iteration, uh, not boxing yourself into uh, clunky deployments. I mean, this should be pretty easy to deploy quickly, and as you're gonna be iterating on your code in those sorts of things, that you don't wanna have that be a stopgap like it is for me right now. <laughs> uh, so this actually turned into more of this Instead of just being a single lambda function, it broke out into, well, three big pieces with some extra interesting things in the middle here. Uh, this is that, just closer. Uh, so I guess I'll kind of start here. Instead of having everything be uh, found, registered, and uh, from a single Lambda function. The first Lambda function here is actually doing a discovery on that host. So as the host is created, this will gather all the pertinent information, uh, VPC IDs, uh, um, IP addresses, things like that. And that actually will feed an SNS stream, which again, for the iteration piece of this, I think we went that route. I originally was gonna have Lambda call another Lambda function, but having an SNS in the middle, I think if we decide there needs to be something else that needs this information, then we can easily just tack that onto the SNS stream without having to change the code base. Uh, so the next piece here, let's see. Um, again, the first piece, just blown up. Uh, one of the things we ran into is we found out that our Lambda functions needed to talk directly to some of the hosts, and in order to do that, they needed to be in the VPCs. And an added complexity to that is, well, the number of VPCs that we have. So I haven't quite solved for this yet, but each of the Lambdas for this piece, we're gonna have to have a Lambda in each individual VPC. Uh, and those are all talking back to a Dynamo table, where um, I guess the reason that it's in the VPC is it's doing an SMP uh, uh, walk, I guess. So as it discovers that information, gets that information, populates a Dynamo stream, which feeds the final function, which was kind of what it started to be, uh, the final Lambda function that does the registration. Uh, and that function also will alert like our hip chat room and then uh, actually create Jira tickets if there's any issues along the way. I guess that's pretty much it. Um, big takeaways, expect duration, and that it's not too difficult to get started with. So I encourage you to give it a shot. Uh, any questions for Bryce while we have them? We'll keep them short. Awesome, you're off the look easy. I, I actually, I have one oh, question. Sure. <laughs> just because you mentioned just off the cuff some really cool sounding integrations, can you talk a tiny bit more about how you have stuff like connecting into, into HipChat and you know firing off other things? It's like, oh wow, that you've built this entire ecosystem there. Like, just tell us a little bit more about the, the chat integration specifically. The chat integration, um, that is actually pretty easy. Um, 
there's just a, a JSON blob that you need to feed to the uh, HipChat API. So uh, I populate that with some of the information that's being gathered from uh, the Lambda functions. And that just feeds that API, and uh, depending on whatever the status codes are uh, of the host being registered, so it's an API calling an API uh, that feeds that information to HipChat. And because you're putting that into HipChat, do you feel like you're getting a different audience for that than you would if somebody had to go and look for the information? Like, what's the purpose specifically of having it there? <coughs> Um, I guess just kind of visibility into what's actually happening. Uh, I know for me, there's always a lot of things happening that I'm not always aware of, and being able to just have a room that's like, here's a deployment of like 20 servers that just happened that I didn't realize was going to happen that day. Hey, uh, just to get one more thought out of you, can you can you chat a bit about um, what we were doing before we started doing this? I a little bit of the motivation on why we started going this route? Sure. Um, so before this, um, our deployments were using Ansible, and this was kind of baked into the Ansible playbooks. And I think the biggest part and the motivation for using Lambda was to disconnect that from the deployment time, um, so to speed up the deployment time. And then also I think we had issues um, uh, I think they would fail occasionally. Uh, there's some nuances with Logic Monitor that if a host exists and has the same IP, blah, 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 uh, it would fail and then kill the deployment. All right, so it sounds like you got some serious uh, incremental improvement in your processes yeah. just by going to this. Very true. That's excellent value. Great to hear all about this, Bryce. Thank you so much. No all right. Thanks, Bryce. All right, one more round of applause for Bryce. Paul. Okay, Paul, you're on. Bridget, I'm going to let you intro Paul. I don't, I don't even know the guy. Somebody said he worked here. Kat told me he's cool, so. Paul is pretty awesome. Well, he didn't, he didn't say you were cool. He said it's cool that you talk. Big difference. I'm just kidding. Paul's actually really cool. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Maybe I didn't mean to sound like a jerk, but I didn't. All right, and Andy, give Paul one. Give Paul one up here while I, uh, while I tell people about working with Paul. All right, how, raise your hand if you work now or have worked with Paul. All right, there's at least four or five people here who know him how much fun Paul is. So I, I got to work. I got to work with sometimes at the bidding of Paul for like two years, which was great, and. Um, I think one of those things that leads to really good collaboration and cooperation between ops and dev teams is when your dev teams are opinionated, know what they need, know what they want, and aren't afraid to completely upend the entire apple cart and do something different. I can't count the number of times that Paul was just like, why don't we just have some Hadoop? And like suddenly we have a completely different infrastructure than we had before. And it sounds like yeah, he's doing something exciting here too. So. Uh, Give it up for Paul. Hello. Hi, Paul. Um, I'm Paul. Um, I, I, work with, I work for Camp. I am a principal software engineer, but really I'm a principal agitator. <laughs> uh, I, I've been at SPS for a couple years. I started shortly after Ken did. I don't know how shortly. Just a few months. Um, uh, so when AWS announced Lambda, I thought, oh my god, this is the coolest thing ever. And then I sort of forgot about it for a few months. And then I tried playing around with it. And it's cool, because I don't have to think about things like where is my server? Um, I feel like now we finally have real cloud computing. It's I just throw some code up there and I tell it when I want to execute, and it does, and it's cool. So I'm sorry, I am, I didn't prepare very well because I was going to be with Andy Yost, who had a steak last night, stuffed with cheese. And, uh, He's wishing he stayed kosher. <laughs> so I had to redo my entire presentation to account for that. And uh, 
So yeah, we were doing cool things in the beginning, like what Bryce showed, like we can do little operational kind of things, but what if we want to do cooler things? So I started thinking about the process, which we develop code, we commit it, it gets built and test and promoted and QA does something, I don't know what, and then it goes to production. And I know that it really sometimes looks like that. There's still some structure in there, and you could maybe predict where things are going to go, but let's just assume that this is a reasonable approximation of the way things happen. So then we thought a little th further. Here's all the places we thought, oh, we can automate that with Lambda. And we still have a few places where we got the monkeys developing, the whoever doing the emerging your pull requests, and our cuddly kittens doing QA. <laughs> um, so developers still need to write their own code, uh, still need to do pull requests, still need to have passing tests, <laughs> are still a bunch of whiny babies. <laughs> and, but they're empowered to, and the <laughs> code for Lambda. Uh, we don't have to think about most of the stuff that we had to think about before, and it's cool. So the things that we decided we could automate are we can have a webhook from GitHub that calls an API gateway that triggers a Lambda call that then will build my artifacts to get on S3, which triggers yet another Lambda that does the build, or does the deploy, which then triggers another Lambda that runs my automated tests. And if they pass, then you can promote that code to a higher environment, which would copy your artifact to another directory on S3, which then guess we'll have more Lambda, more deployments, and this is another view of what just happened. Um, same sort of thing, except for that we got streams crossing, but we're not in any danger. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I didn't talk about is if your builds take a long time, you can run it in a container on ECS. How cool is that? Um, that's servers, though. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, so I'm just going to skip it. <laughs> um, so then we get back to Cuddles with our acceptance testing, and a person has to do that. Who knows what QA does? <laughs> um, so in doing that, we discovered some caveats. One is, you know, we only got five minutes. And five minutes is a long time, but we found we bumped into that a few times, because we are not only building and deploying our code, but we're provisioning the whole environment. So we're spinning up databases and set of standing up VPCs and defining security groups and everything all in Lambda. And when you're doing all of that, sometimes it takes more than five minutes. And I'm looking at maybe using SWF to orchestrate all that so we don't hit that five minutes, but I'm not there yet. Um, also ran into a problem with the 60 second default timeout in Voto, which is the Python AWS client library, where I was using Voto to invoke Lambda to s deploy all my Lambda functions. And at some point, I got so many that it just barely went over 60 seconds. And then guess what the Voto client does when you time out? It tries again. And it will try again for five minutes. So I had. 15 versions of 12 different functions in five minutes. And it was awesome. And I didn't know what was happening right away. I just like, why isn't this working? So I retried, retried. And now I have 250. And I had to write a function to clean up functions. So, so that was that. And that was embarrassing. And now you all know. Um, we also discovered that S3 occasionally loses events. And it's about one in a million. That's within their SLA, so it is what it is. But it is annoying, and 
So occasionally I will do a build, it lands on S3, and it doesn't get deployed. And I don't know why. There's a, in CloudWatch, in the logs, there is an entry that I saw this three times, but no log, because it just didn't do anything. Who knows why? Um, uh, initially, it seemed really daunting, but just don't give up. Just It's going to be awesome in the end. Also, when they when I started thinking about how do we deploy this, we need to be in subnets because we're talking to databases that you can't talk to from public lambda because security. And so I need to think about how many IPs I'm gonna need for my subnets for Lambda. And so we have a call with AWS to find out how does that scale? And they gave us a simple calculation, like figure out how many concurrent per minute, and then like divide it by two, and that's how many you need. So that's all I got there. <laughs> um, and startup latency was uh, something we noticed that pretty reliably for a public land the first time it found, uh, is executed, it's between 600 milliseconds and three seconds that it will take for execution to start. In a VPC, it's about three times that. And we were seeing like six to eight seconds at worst case. Scenario. But once it runs once, it's great, until it has to scale. <laughs> but we don't have to think about it, we just have to be prepared for it. Occasionally, it's slow. Um, so what we have now, I wish I wanted to have this thing built like this. We have this framework that we call Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. <laughs> L3 for short, which they, it's Python. If you're writing Python Lambda functions, then that's super awesome. And you can actually run an API gateway locally with all of your functions backing it, and it's cool. And then it also is a collection of Lambda functions that are deployed to uh, AWS. So when I drop my Artifact into S3, it triggers a deployment which will deploy all these things and it will provision VPC, security groups, uh, ECS, Elastic Hash, RDS, uh, Kinesis, Lambda, API Gateway, Dynamo. There's probably a few other things that I don't know about but should because I wrote the code. Um, um, and we use API Gateway stages to do versioning, so when we do a release, it just creates another stage, which is another version, so we can easily do red link deployments. <coughs> uh, and Lambda has versioning for free, which is awesome. Um, what else we got? I don't know what this means. Uh, oh, we're almost to the point where we completely eliminate Jenkins from the deployment process. We only, in fact, we only need it right now for doing builds and running tests, and we could easily eliminate it for that as well. We just haven't yet, which is <laughs> where we want to be. We want to trigger builds. We're not doing that yet from um, GitHub. Uh, we want to build on Docker because it's better to run our tests on Docker and maybe even open source this library. Um, is that all I got? Oh, I have this. I, have this. I, I kind of live by this where I know I'm never going to get everything done, so I release all the time and sometimes it sucks. Sometimes I do good. So, any questions? Who's up the mic? Oh, tell me. I heckled Jeff for not having a mic in his hand earlier, so. Oh, while you're while you're walking that back there, I'm going to cheat and ask one myself, which is, hey Paul, do you think that the um, the S3 every once in a while just not having the stuff you need is an eventual consistency issue, or have you checked back and checked back and like it's never going to be eventually consistent? I thought originally it was eventually consistent and it wasn't and but 
I could load the file myself during that, and it was like a five minute window that it didn't show up for it. So I feel like it was something else, and we've asked AWS about it, and they couldn't figure it out either, but because mostly because the logs are nothing. There's nothing in the logs, so what do we do? But, but it sounds like you can work around it. Yeah, by basically touching the file on S3 and guess what, the next time it works. Who was it that? So, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking it sounded kind of like you were re-implementing Jenkins and Lambda. So my question is, why do you want to get rid of Jenkins? Uh, I don't want to maintain a server. Even, I mean, yeah, it's a virtual machine in AWS, and we got people like Andy Delmeyer to manage it for me, but Andy hates his job. Yeah, I mean, so. if, you can have, if you have Andy to do your dirty work, then what could the problem possibly be? Uh, <laughs> I also really hate writing jobs for Jenkins, and I like writing Python. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a good answer for that other than I can do it, so why not? And it's saving me a lot of time. And I don't know, like, I have a Jenkins for this project I'm working on right now, which is some sort of comfort project I can talk about, which is driving me crazy. But that Jenkins like disappeared two months ago, and nobody knows where it went. <laughs> and in fact, the Andy Yost, who was going to talk with me, has been trying to get it back, and he can't. And he's like the smartest guy in this room if he were in here. <laughs> it, I just don't, I don't want to deal with it. So I do all my stuff in Lambda because it's, I'm a developer and I think in code for some reason. So, and Lambda's just code, whereas Jenkins is this ops thing that Andy understands, but I'm, I'm well ready to some other levels. So. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I, I hit his Jenkins server. <laughs> Man sure it's cooking with me. So that's the new hiding the key to the network, now you hide the Jenkins server? Yes, hide the Jenkins server. But now developers have a different way to get their code in, so I don't know what I'm going to do. The, the bonus to how I'm doing all this is we don't need to give any of the developers access. They just, they if they make their artifact the right way, then all of the things that needs to happen, that's all done within AWS with specific IM roles that can only do certain things. So it's a lot harder for us monkeys to screw things up. I think I think to add to that, you know, it might be worth a different talk some other time uh, from from where Bryce gets to with his deployment problems, but like it's getting Lambda deployed efficiently isn't necessarily something that is super smooth either. So well, I mean, Bryce Bryce did that a different way. So I what I did is super smooth, but it took me a long time to get there, right? So, and I really hope that I can share that code with the world because it's pretty slick, even though I wrote it. <laughs> Don't cut yourself down like that. I have to. <laughs> so, um, could you go a little more into how you're doing blue green deployments using Stages and API Gateway? Because I've been kind of puzzling about how to do that. And it's like, oh, that sounds like a really clever idea. Why didn't I think of that? Um, basically, for every version, I just create a new stage. So there's, I have a V70 stage and a V60 stage. And then I, depending on which one I want to be, in production, I guess, I just repoint my DNS to that one. And if I have one that is still draining off, those things that need to hit it can hit that stage directly. Um, some things like we are reading from Kinesis uh, with Lambda that writes to this API, and it actually, it just hits that version directly. And when I need to go to a different version, I can just redeploy that Lambda function. Okay, so you're using DNS to do the switching, because I've used, oh, uh, so you're using DNS, because I've used load balancers to do uh, blue-green, and yeah. I love that approach, but uh, I don't think there's a load balancer in front of an API gateway, so. No. Or is there a, a lot of front in front of it. 
Yeah. There's probably there's, a lot of them. Yeah, there it's it's cloud front in front of API Gateway, which is I don't know the world's biggest Whatever. code balancer, I guess. It's magic. Yeah, it is magic. Maybe somebody in here knows what it actually does, but it's magic. Great. I think we're gonna we're gonna stop questions there just to give everyone a chance to uh, give Paul another round of applause.